Good afternoon, everyone. Today it is our pleasure to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Ravi Dagger as our second speaker in the Ajivan Lecture Series. Mr. Dagger is the People's Director for Desco Business Services in Bangalore, which is an organization under one of the largest retailing firms in the world, Desco. Uh, in his capacity as People's Director, he has managed national teams in the field of human resources and he's an expert in the field itself with over 10 years of experience. His numerous achievements range from co-creating the strategy for Tesco Business Services, leading the India operations to its first credit of Great Place to Work, and uh, many of the successful global projects and establishments. For us students, we can get an interesting insight into his work by an article he authored about strategies to enhance the efficiency of a workplace by, by creating a simulating and collaborating environment. Uh, I would now like to invite him to the podium to share with us his valuable experience. one so I can talk around a bit. So hello CISP. Thank you for having me visit and you fed me some lunch so it was definitely worthwhile coming. Um, I am dad to uh, Woody who is in grade four and Daisy who is in UG1. Anybody know Woody Dagger or Daisy Dagger? Good. Oh okay you do. But you see, they'll, they'll think that I'm going to embarrass them, so it's quite good if you, if you don't know who they are. That's my most important job. And then my second job is to be the People Director for Tesco, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that actually means in a moment. So I'm used to uh, talking to some pretty big audiences um, in the job that I have, but I woke up this morning and um, I was actually pretty nervous. Because there was a realisation that I have no idea what to expect when I'm talking to a, a group of young people at TISP. I have no idea what will interest you. And um, whenever I get a little bit nervous, um, I think about uh, a really nice animation that we sometimes use at work. So I'm going to show it you now. Um, if you've seen it before, then I'm sorry if I'm repeating it. Um, but it cheers me up and it often encourages people in the office to participate and speak up a bit. So we'll watch that and then I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're going to cover in the 30 minutes or so that I have with you. So fingers crossed the technology works and I will hand over to uh, Barack Obama for this. Your voice makes a difference. And if you don't believe that, I want to leave you with one last story. You can hear it. When I... Can technology people, can we help? Your voice makes a difference. Thank you. And if you don't believe that, I want to leave you with one last story. When I ran for the presidency, oh wait, I, I fly down to North Carolina, South Carolina, South Carolina. Alarm goes off, and I feel terrible. I'm exhausted. Think I'm coming down with a cold. I open up the curtains. It's pouring down rain outside. Pouring down rain. Horrible day. I get the newspaper outside my door, and there's a bad story about me in the New York Times. I get dressed, shaved, walk out, my umbrella blows open, that ever happened to you? And I get soaked, soaked, I'm just soaked. I get in the car, I say, all right, how long is it going to take to Greenwood? An hour and a half. Finally, I get out, and I walk in, and there are like 15, 20 people there. And I will tell you, they didn't look any happier to see me than I did to see them. And so I go around the room and I say, how you do, what do you do? But they're not really feeling it right now. And suddenly I hear this voice from the back just shout, fire up! And everybody in the room says, fire up! And then I hear the voice say, ready to go! And everybody in the room says, ready to go! And I don't know what's going on. I think these people are crazy. Maybe I should have come here. And then I look in the back of the room. And there's this middle-aged woman, she's got a big church hat, and she got, I think, a gold tooth. Turns out, she holds a position in the local NAACP office. 
and also, I'm not kidding you, is a private detective. This is a true story. She's like a, uh, she's, she's like a private eye. Although, it's hard to think that you wouldn't see her coming. She's very colorful. And she is known, wherever she goes, by saying, this chant, fired up, ready to go. And every meeting she goes to, she does this thing. But the interesting thing is, after a while, I'm starting to get kind of fired up. I'm, 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 not, I'm, starting, to, I'm starting to feel like I'm ready to go. And all those, all those negative thoughts, all those bad memories start kind of drifting away. And it just goes to show you how one voice can change the world. And if it can change a room, it can change a city. after lunch actually because you get a bit of energy back in the room so I'm going to give it my best shots I'm going to talk to you about a few things and then hopefully we can have a good conversation afterwards and you can give me some troublesome questions does that sound all right yes okay so um, here's what I'm going to cover I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the company that I work for Tesco I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my career and the choices I've made and then I'm going to talk to you about some of the big changes that are happening everywhere my teams are that I'm facing into. I'll tell you why you're going to face some of that and why we should all be very positive about that. And then finally I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the role that I think great leaders have to play as we face into some of those changes. And I'm going to do all those things with just five slides. So hopefully I'm not going to bore you by just repeating everything that you see on there. Okay? So, um, this is Tesco. Uh, who's heard of Tesco? Okay, hands down. Who's been into a Tesco shop? Isn't it wonderful? No, you don't have to say that. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, so it's a bit of a mixture of people who know it well and have seen it and other people that have probably just seen it in Whitefield somewhere. So, um, let me tell you about it. It is the fifth biggest retailer in the world by sales. We are number one in the UK. We have 7,000 shops um, across eight different countries. Um, part of my job is to look after 450,000 colleagues. That's how many people we have working for us. Um, and all of the products that we sell, and there's a lot of them, on a weekly basis, we sell 80 million things. It's massive. And we source, we get all of those products from 73 different countries around the world. So it's a pretty big operation. But we're not just a shop. We have Tesco Bank in the UK. We have one of the world's largest analytics business called Dunhumby, which also has an office in India, funnily enough. We have something called a wholesale business called Booker. And some of you have heard of Tata, I presume? Yes. The Tata group are pretty big in India, and we have a partnership with them. Uh, we have a number of shops called Star Bazaar. How many of you have seen a Star Bazaar shop? Okay. There'll be more of those, and then we'll get better. And one day, we'll have some Tesco products in there. Let's, let's wait and see. So I have, um, my job at Tesco is two things. Uh, firstly, I have to make sure that we have the right culture and the right capabilities in three main locations, in India, in Hungary, in, uh, in Budapest is the city, and up in Dundee in Scotland. And I've got to make sure we've got the right people who can deliver things for all of our Tesco group. Things like technology, finance, property design, and all the help that we give to our customers when they come in and visit us. 
So that's my first job. And then my second job is to run a really big operations team whose only job is to make sure that all of those 450,000 people get paid for the work they do and receive all the benefits that we promised them. So if my, if my team get anything wrong, we have a, a lot of very, very unhappy people. So that's our business. I've been there for nine years and I'm just going to show you a little bit about how I got there. This is for me really, not for you. It just helps me think about the things I've done and I can describe it. Um, and it's not because I want you to be interested in me, but I think sometimes when you're hearing from people who have got different careers and you're not too far away from thinking about what you want to do, it's quite nice, I think, to hear the different journeys that people have taken. So you can start to think about, oh, what would I have done in that scenario? And okay, he's ended up doing that job. I wonder how he got there. So here's how I started. Right at the top, 12 o'clock, um, is the school I always wanted to go to because it was opposite my house. And at 11 years old, in the British school system, there's an exam called the 11 plus, and I failed it. So I couldn't go to the school. But then I did pretty well, and I managed at the age of 16 to get in there for the last couple of years. Absolutely loved it. I've met most of my lifelong friends at this school. And while I was there, the only thing I loved, really, was music. And I know I don't look very cool, right, but I was pretty good at music. I was in a band. Um, we won a massive competition. Uh, we were on the radio. Um, and we actually had quite a lot of time in recording studios. So I thought, maybe I could be famous. Um, but I also was a bit realistic and I knew that maybe I would have to get another job just in case it didn't work out. So um, my oldest sister, Holly, she went straight into work um, at the age of 18 when she's finished school. And there was no pressure from my parents at all on what would be the right path, what I should do. But I decided that I would go to university because I thought it would give me that time to get a bit of certainty on what would be the right career for me. And I also really wanted to have some experience of living away from home because I'd never done it before. So I went to uh, Lancaster University, which is the one o'clock symbol. Um, in England, that place where it rains all the time, Lancaster is right up in the northwest where it rains even more. But it was quite far away from my parents and my family. And at that time in life, that was the right thing for me to do. Um, I had a real fascination with the First World War, the Second World War, all of that time. So I chose to do international relations and politics as my degree. And in week one, I met this person called Amy. And 10 years later, I married her. So it was probably a good choice to uh, go to Lancaster, so she says. Um, so I graduate and um, I've done this politics degree and I still have no idea what I'm going to do. And Amy goes and gets herself a job in London and she says, you should come. And I said, I have no desire to work in London. To be honest, it was a bit scary. Um, London is massive. I'd only been there to watch a couple of football matches, not much else. Um, but I had no choice really, because Amy is pretty bossy. So I followed her to London. I was still doing my music at this time, and I was lucky enough to sign a, a songwriting contract when I got to London. And um, I got some money in advance, so I bought a nice guitar. Not that one, that's actually nicer than the one I bought. And, um, and I paid off some of my student debts, so that was great. But the problem is, uh, with a songwriting contract, you have to then write some songs that have to be pretty good. You have to get somebody to sing them and play them, and you have to make a lot of money from them in order to make it worthwhile. And the thing is, after I got that money, I just, I just couldn't write any songs. Um, I like playing everybody else's, but I just couldn't come up with anything. So um, I realised, okay, I just have to get a job, because otherwise I can't afford to stay in London. And we were literally, um, Amy was working for a wine company, and she would get home, and we had so little money, the only thing we could afford was to buy chips, fries. I mean, they're good, right? 
but you can only eat a certain quantity of those things. So I realized I also had to get a job. So um, back in those days, we did have the internet, but things like LinkedIn didn't exist. So in a newspaper, I found this article um, for a job advert saying to be a headhunter working in luxury fashion retail. I thought that sounds okay, I could do this. So I applied for this job and I got it. And it was in the tiniest little office. There were four people that were there and it was funded by this big, uh, big American company. But on my first day, I had to put these headphones on and just listen to these CDs that were all pre-recorded Americans telling me how to do this job. And then after that, nobody gave me any direction and I had to work it out for myself. I absolutely hated it. In fact, I hated it so much that I used to have to get a bus from my house in the morning and every time I saw this bus, it was called the R68. It used to make me feel sick. I just thought, I cannot be there anymore. It was, it was a soul-destroying place. But I knew at this early stage that I wasn't going to write any songs, and actually I had to build this career. So I wanted to protect my CV, and I had to stay for 12 months doing this job. And then I decided I will give the industry I work in one more chance. Um, and I applied to work for this company in the purple called RHR. They stand for Retail Human Resources. And the good news was, I found a place I loved. I was there for seven years. Whilst I was there, I went back to university and I studied in the evenings at Middlesex University doing my HR qualifications. Um, and the company funded that, so it was a brilliant place to be. And by the time I left seven years later, I was on the leadership team of this family-run business. Amy and I had now moved on from eating fries and we made enough money to buy our first apartment or flat in London. Um, finally we got married and then uh, we decided we would start a family and, um, and Woody was born. Now this is the first time I've really made a big life choice because when you work in recruitment like I did, you get a basic salary that's quite low and then if you're good at your job and you're successful in what you're able to sell, you get a commission and you can make quite a lot of money. But the thing is you never really know how much you're going to earn each month. And that's fine when you haven't got any commitments like any kids. But suddenly I realised that if we're going to have a start a family, then I need to make sure that the income I get is high enough so that we can afford to look after them and give Woody everything that we wanted him to have. So I decided I would um, move to work for a big organisation and um, I joined Tesco. And uh, they are huge in the UK, absolutely huge. They're on every single street corner. And, um, but when you go into the office it felt quite welcoming and it only took a week before they said yes, um, we'd like to join. So um, I started working there, and then I've basically realised, oh my goodness, working for these big businesses is completely different from the small family-run businesses. Even the language they talk, and I'm not talking about Hindi or Canada or English, right? I'm talking about a business jargon. They use words that you've never heard of before. They abbreviate every single thing they're talking about and they expect you to know it like you've been there for years. And it's pretty daunting. And you remember I gave you some facts about Tesco. It is massive. So you walk into the office on the first day and you're one of 8,000 people. Right? So you've got about 2,000 people here, maybe? Something like that? Maybe not that many. But if you can imagine all of TISB times it four times, and you're walking into office and you've got to work out, how am I going to get things done here? It's really, really different. But I settled in fairly quickly and um, I've now been there for nine years. I've done six different jobs. I've had two promotions, uh, one from manager to head off and then head off to director. And I've been lucky enough to end up in India for the time being. But then I had to make a second life choice. So I was getting a bit bored at work. 
Um, I, I did enjoy my job, but I've been doing the same thing for a little while. And I get bored pretty easily. So, um, and Daisy was now around, um, and she was just about to start school in the UK. So I said to my boss, I want to have a break, and I'll do you a deal. I said, I will find a person to do one of my jobs, and then find a person to do another of my jobs, and then I'm going to take six weeks off, and I'm going to go travel around Canada with my kids, and then when I come back, I'll do something different. And he said, you got a deal. And so I was surprised, so I booked my trip to Canada, and then um, I'm about to go, I've got two weeks left before I leave, and he sits me down, he said, I know what we want you to do next. We want you to go to India. And I said, absolutely no. I would swear here, but I'm at school, so I can't. Absolutely no way. Right. I've been to India lots with work anyway. But the idea of moving my kids, Amy was, had a brilliant job, and the idea of moving us all was just too much. So I said, look, I'm only gone for six weeks, so you better come up with another idea pretty quickly. Um, let's think about it, I'll see you soon. I went home, and um, Amy was upstairs, and I shouted to her, Amy, can you believe it? They said, go to India. She said, that is brilliant, let's go. <laughs> so I said, um, well, Amy's the boss, right? So I texted my boss, and I said, well, if you're sure, the very next week, we got our visas, and we had to come here in secret because we were doing a big restructure at work and some people would be leaving, so nobody could see me. So I had to look around the houses, Woody had to come here and sit in the exam, we didn't even know that such a thing would exist, and I didn't know if it was right, and then at midnight, we put Woody, and we were all in it, but we put Woody in a rickshaw, tuk tuk, auto, whatever you want to call it, right? And we uh, drove back from the centre of town, and we got in, and I was really tired. And Woody said to me, that is the best thing I have ever done in my life. Now, I was like, we, we, he's done a lot of things in his life. But if he's easily pleased by the tuk-tuk, then we have got to move to India. So that sealed the decision, and we moved over here. So that was a big life decision again. So I've been in India now for two and a bit years. And um, I am so glad that Amy made us come here because I've just realised a lot more about myself um, and about the world of work that I would never really have appreciated. Um, I think that it's super, super important that you really get to understand yourself. But you, equally important that you get to understand other people. And I realised that there are whole nations of people that have a perception of things or a judgement of things on what is right and wrong but that doesn't necessarily make it right. And I came to India with lots of ideas about how things were done. And at first I found that quite difficult. I know how to drive, stay in a lane, wait my turn. <laughs> yeah. I know how when I'm waiting, when well, I'm going to buy something at the shop, there is a queue and I will wait my turn. And I know that I should be eating with a knife and fork. Right? These are things that I've been brought up with. And I have recognised, that's my story and what I believe in, but my goodness, there's a lot more people in India with a very different view to me, right? So I think that it's opened my eyes to how things work, and I would never take away this experience from, well, either me or my kids. And I would say to any of you, that, I mean, I know there's some of you in the audience here who are probably thinking, why did my parents bring me to India? Why did my parents bring me back from the USA, you know? And some of you might be thinking that, and I'd be saying, oh my goodness, you are some of the luckiest people because you have lived and travelled this world in a very different way from most of the people in this nation and across the world. So never, never feel bad for that. And for those of you that haven't travelled, and if ever you're hesitant to think about doing it, I would say just take the chance, take the risk. Every job I've done felt risky at the time until I was in it. So absolutely take the opportunity. So that is what I've done. You can ask me about some of those decisions later if you want. And now I'm going to talk serious business. So my job is difficult. Because everything that's happening in this world is changing really fast. 
and I have nobody to tell me what the answer is. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some of these changes and explain them, because I think if you are going into the workforce in the next couple of years, even four or five years, some of this will be the reality for you, and not just what people are planning for. So let me explain it. Family 2.0, I don't know if you can hear, everybody read the screen. Yeah? Family 2.0, I'll explain what this means. Did you know that in just a couple of years' time, one in every five people will be 65 years old or older? Right? We have a massive aging population. Now, that is changing the way that lots of businesses have to think about who they've got working for them. And it's either a massive, massive risk for us, or it's a huge opportunity. So for example, in Vietnam, where there is a huge farming industry, most of the younger generations don't want to go and do the hard, laborious farming tasks that their parents have done. And it has meant that actually, an economy that really thrives off agriculture is not going to be able to survive if they don't bring through a next generation or think about how they use their older workforce. So it's a massive problem. And in some of those areas, we have to bring more women into work. But we're still pretty old-fashioned. So the costs of how much it is to have the children going to childcare if you haven't got the family support is too high. The policies we have about how long you can take off work if you have a baby aren't very good. And there is massive issues that have been around for a long time, long time about how much women get paid versus how much men get paid. So we've got to sort this stuff out pretty quickly. Also, all the things that we think about are all about how do we train you um, when you're coming into the workforce. We think that you're going to be with us at maximum for 10, 15 years. We haven't really thought about an older generation that might come back into the workforce because they're going to live longer. So we have people in our shops in Thailand and Malaysia that retired. They were like um, astrophysicists. Crazy big, really important jobs. And now they want to earn some money. And so we've decided, right, rather than hire young people in Thailand, we're going to go after all of these people. Because they have lived some really great lives, they've got some great stories, and they can connect with people in our shops, sometimes better than people that are kind of just doing it at the start of their career, but want to do something much bigger. So it's completely changing who we employ. And I have to rethink about everything that we're doing, how we're training, how we're recruiting. It's a massive change. Also, for the very, very first time, we have four generations all working together. Now, that might not sound weird, but let me just explain how it feels to me. You know in your classroom, everybody's the same age as you, right? So you talk about all the things that are common to you. Now, when I first started working, and I got on with my mates at work, I just kind of assumed that, well, we're all working here together, we're all probably the same age. And then there's that embarrassing moment when I start to talk to my team about the TV show that I used to watch, or the songs that I used to hear. And I realise that they weren't even born when the song was written, when the TV show finished after it had been repeated seven times. And then suddenly I'm thinking, well, the things they're interested in, and the opinions I have, and the ideas I've formed, they're all so different. So can you imagine now the challenge of having our 70-year-old working on a checkout, working in the same team as somebody who's just coming into the workforce at 16. No, it's a very, very strange dynamic, and again, it's something else we're trying to work and get our heads around. I'll talk about the next two together. Health and well-being and social conscience. Um, this is really important. So big, big businesses are used to selling lots of things and making lots of money. And then suddenly, over the last few years, it's become more and more important about doing that, but also doing that in a way that you're really protecting the environment and thinking about the people that work for you and you interact with. And how people make choices is very different. So suddenly, 
If you don't say anything, if you don't say anything at all, then suddenly they'll think that you're the bad guys. And if you do speak out and say something, you can get it massively wrong. And then your company is absolutely in a mess and you can't hire people. So a big, big challenge for us is how do we make sure that we operate with a social conscience and we look after people differently? You still with me, guys? You still with me? He's not. Anyway, um, let's talk about the next bit. Value redefined. What does that mean? Right. Now, when you come into a job in the first place, you'd be thinking, oh, um, in the old days, it'd be how do I get promoted? How do I stay in this job and get promoted and keep on growing? And that's changed, right? People know that they're not going to have one job for the rest of their life. They're probably going to have five, six different careers. So suddenly I've got to be thinking, how do I reskill people? How do I reinvent things? And how do I give them new experiences? Like I'm having coming to India. Yeah? How do we do this for a much bigger group of people so they want to stay with us and they have fulfilling careers? Big, big change. And then technology. Everybody talks about technology. Right? A third of people are worried about automation and it will take their jobs away. And yet, a third of all the technology jobs in this world will not be filled in 2020 because we don't have enough skills. And actually the best tech is the stuff that works really, really well with humans, not in isolation. So I've got to be thinking about what are the skills that you can never code, that are truly human, and how do we dial that up so we make the best use out of everybody we have? Things like empathy, critical thinking, some problem solving. This is the stuff you can never code. So I don't want to be training people to code anymore, I want to be training them on the very human skills that we've somewhere forgotten along the lines. And then also it's really tough, right? I have my phone here, I have my laptop here, I have WhatsApp groups with my leadership teams, my own teams, I have emails coming in from every country around the world, and it's always there. And we've gone from trying to have this work-life balance, where you can have some nice home life and park work, to it always being on all the time. And it's become a work-life blur instead. And we have to work out how do we help people who want a separate private life, they've got these boundaries, as well as work with people who are quite happy for it to be always on all the time, and how we deal with that. And there'll be some real challenges for you when you go into the workforce. You'll be working with lots of old people, right? And you've got to make some choices about which company you work for. And you've got to be thinking about your own well-being. Because if you're super, super busy and work are always getting at you, it's not good for your health. So how do you solve that? So they're the big challenges that I'm facing. And it's really scary, all this stuff. And then there's crime, and then there's global warming, and there's poverty, and there's malnutrition, there's terrorism, and there's Brexit. Right? In that order, I think. These things are all really scary. And doom and gloom always really feels like it's the story of our day, right? And I, um, I saw all of that and I actually kind of agreed with some of that pessimism. And then when I was back in the UK recently, one of my good friends said, and he heard everything I had to say, and he said, I think you need to read this, this book by Johan Norberg, and that's the smiley progress face on the right hand side. He said, read that book, it's really quick, and then let's have another chat afterwards. So I downloaded it on my Kindle that day. He was right, it was quick. I read it on the aeroplane home. And after that, it changed my mind. And I realized there are masses amount of reasons to be positive and face into what's going on in the world. And so I thought, I've got to share this. So I sent it around to everybody at work. I bought copies of it, I've made people read it, and it's having a good effect. So I want to tell you about it. Right? Because otherwise you might be, what I need you to do is, Put your phones down whenever you've got them, if you, those of you that got a phone. Who's got a phone? Who's really got a phone? Who watches TV? Come on. You all have some screen time. Right, so 
If you divert your eyes from your phones, your TVs, your laptops, your iPods, whatever you've got, iPods, they're very old, iPads, sorry. Uh, if you divert your eyes from that for a second, and you stop watching the news flashes, right, and you start to eyes up, look around you, the science, the technology, the wealth, everything that is just part of your day-to-day -day lives, if you look up and see that, that is actual proof of the massive progress that we are all making. And we are witnessing the greatest transformation of our quality of life that we've ever seen. But you'd never feel like that. So child labour, poverty, malnutrition is all falling at the fastest rate ever. And the risk of you being exposed to war, a living under a dictator with no freedom, or being involved in a natural disaster, is tiny. There are exceptions, except for the tree star falling down, of course. But there are exceptions, right? <laughs> that woke you up, thank you very much. But these are exceptions, whereas once upon a time, that was the normal thing, right? The biggest fuel for progress is our knowledge. And the biggest break on that progress is a lack of imagination and a lack of freedom, right? And the most powerful resource that we have got is hopeful, brilliant, young minds with self-belief that if they can apply it, will change things for everybody for better. And that is everybody in this room. So I want you to know with all the chaos that is going on outside, or it feels chaos, this is just massive progress. I and mean, we can talk about that a bit if there's something on your mind about it. I think it's really, really important for you all to recognise what's happening. Now look, for you to go and do that, we have to be creating the sorts of places you want to work where you can do this stuff. I've got a bit of a problem with what I've seen in organisations. Because in reality, we've not moved on. And there are lots of places at work where people are afraid to put up their hand and say, oh, um, I've made a mistake, or I can't do something, or I'm not sure what to do. Right? And if, if that is how it feels at work, then actually what we've created is a place where people come, and they hide, and they fake, and they lie a bit about how they feel. And yet we're standing here asking you all to come in, forget your technology addiction, build strong relationships, find yourselves, and do some brilliant stuff. But we're asking you to do it in that sort of workplace, which I think is really, really odd. And as you have more lectures, I bet lots of people will come and stand in front of you and say, you are the leaders of the future. Has anybody said that to you before? But what I don't get is we're the leaders now, right? And we're living in this work environment, so we have to do something to change it. Now, Tesco has changed a lot since I first joined nine years ago, and it actually was a bit scary when I first arrived, and it's completely not anymore. And I just want to show you uh, one final video, which um, I've, I've called it exclusively at Tesco, because it's just a thing we have internally. Um, and it says a lot more about what I'm trying to say than I can do in words. So I'll flick to that. And fingers crossed this will work. Fingers crossed this will work. Technology man.
drinking without that on your face. When are you going to take that thing off your head? I'm going to get you one day, you lesbian. Anger. Anger. Angry. 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 Emotional. Nervous. Sad. Sad. Really, really sad. It irritates me that people get away with saying things like that. I don't quite get why people just feel the way they do about difference in people's skin tones. It makes no sense to me. Sometimes. We don't realize. How, what we say. And what we do. Can affect people around us. And we don't see. Or the value of people for who they really are. For who they really are. For who they really are. We treat people how they want to be treated. I think Tesco fosters an open environment that encourages people to ask questions in a safe space without fear of any judgment. Every time I've worked with teams, I've always been you know, welcomed with a warm heart. I've never felt that you know, I'm somebody, an outsider, who has stepped into a new role. I've always got the support, I've always got the guidance that I wanted. My hope is that acceptance is everyone's moral value. I want my words to inspire a chain reaction. topics that, that we've covered. What you got? Let's check who was listening. How many shops have Tesco got? 7,000. I can't hear what you're saying, but let's say correct. 7,000. Any questions for me? Who's the bravest and smartest one that's going to ask something? Oh. When you were changing your jobs, you just said, I just went to your company. Did you do it through a newspaper first? 
So the question is, um, when I went and moved jobs, I explained that I just went and got them. Uh, how did I go about it? So the very first one was pretty old-fashioned and the newspaper. But then, from then on, it's always been somebody that I've known or some, a connection that I've made. So when I worked at that purple organisation, RHR, one of the big businesses that I worked with was Tesco. And um, RHR said, uh, oh, Robbie, we've got this job. We'd like you to find us somebody who could recruit for our clothing range. And I cheekily said in the room, well, if I fancy doing it, would you, uh, would you consider me? And they said, yes. So then that's how I started there. And from then on, some of it has been my boss would say, oh, we, we really think you could do this job. And it completely blew my mind. I, but once I was, I was recruiting for jobs in China and Hong Kong, and I just got back to the UK, and they said, we'd like you to be head of HR for IT. And I was like, you've just seen how good I am with technology. You know, I can't even play a video. So how am I going to run IT? And then um, I said, oh, uh, will I get an office? And they said, yes. I said, I'll take the job. <laughs> that's, that's when offices were important. We don't have offices anymore, but um, they were big back then. So, um, so yeah, it's normally about uh, who you're working with and then looking at those opportunities. And I haven't said yes every time. Um, and Amy doesn't always decide for me, but uh, yeah, that's how it works, really. Shall I give you my ID line? So, see first, because this is only how far the microphone goes. Do you um, regret giving up your music? Um, do I regret giving up our music? Well. The thing is, I still play, I still play and um, the, odd, the odd party or gig when I'm back in the UK, and I love that, it's brilliant, it's when I'm, but I'm getting a bit older now, and, it's, uh, and I just don't get time for it, so sometimes if the kids are away then I will play and it's a hobby, um, and of course I would love to have done that as a job, but I still think I'm very lucky to be doing a job that I love actually at Tesco. And there's not many people who um, can turn around and say actually they look forward to going into work every day. I'm lucky I found that. So um, somebody said to me yesterday morning, they said, um, she said, do you think that it's okay for somebody not to have a goal? And I said to her, well, I've never had one. And I, and only things I've really wanted that I've learned in life is I want people to think that I'm an alright person and I want to be really good at anything I want to put my mind to. So I wanted to be really good at music, I wanted to be really good for Tesco, etc, etc. So that keeps me happy. So I think if my only goal in life had been musician, then of course I'd be disappointed. But because I never had that, I think I'm alright. So you're really good at public speaking. How do you practice? Like, how did you become like, you know, not nervous to speak in front of everyone? Well, thank you for the feedback. It makes me feel good. Um, well, I think doing the music really helped because when you're on stage and you're singing, I mean, you know, everybody's looking at you and you kind of get get used to that. And um, at work, lots of people ask me this because I have a notebook. I'll show you it. I have one of these and I write everything down. My entire speech that I've just gone through with you is in that book, but did you see me look at it? Not at all. And it's a really weird habit I've got. So I'll write all the bullet points down, and by writing it, I tend to just memorize or have a bit of flow of what I'm going to say. And then I feel like I've always got it there as backup if I need it, but quite often I can just get going and it's okay. So I feel like you can never go into these things without having thought it through and without having practiced. But I just feel like um, you don't need to overdo it. You know, if I had literally read it or tried to do it word for word, I'd go wrong. So um, I think everybody has their own style and their own ideas. That just works for me. Um, how does one preserve individuality in a workspace with so many thousands of people? Uh, well, so I think that you've just got to walk in and be confident that you can be yourself there. Some of the video that I showed you and why I was talking about some of the things is I think that most businesses realise 
that the only way they're going to get the best talent is if they actually cater for the individual and they let people be who they want to be. So times are changing pretty fast on that front. I feel comfortable where I am, but I think um, you, know, you can see from the video there's also people that don't. But go for it. You know? And if you can't feel like you can be yourself at work, you're in the wrong place, is what I would say. There's no reason for you to be unhappy. There's plenty of choice out there. Does that answer your question? He's faster than me, though. Yeah, how long do you plan on staying in India? Um, as long as I can get away with it. Uh, so I've been, I, I've been here two years and then um, I said to them, right, you need to make a choice now. I'm either going to go quickly or you can extend me for another two years. And um, I left them with a very short notice, so I got extended. So I'll be here for four and then um, I'm really enjoying it. Um, and still learning lots, I'm visiting lots of places, so yeah, as long as I can. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, what do you think is the most valuable experience you had from your music career? No, let's not big it up, right? So it was, it was good. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the story of this then, right? So we won, I was only, I was 16. We won this Battle of the Bands competition and I got given, uh, we got given about 250 pounds. And we decided what we're gonna do with this. So we went into a, a little studio and um, we recorded three songs that we'd written. And then we went to the local bookshop and we bought this book that showed you all the record companies that existed in the UK. And we made a CD and we sent it to every single one of them. And that's how we spent that 250 pounds. We got three replies. One of them was from a big company called Polydor Records. And they said, oh, we really like it. We're gonna come and watch it. So we went to our local bar and we said, we need to put on this really big gig and we invite all of our friends because Polydor Records are coming. So we did a, we had lights, we had sound, we practiced for ages, we invited our mums, our dads, our nans, our grands, and everybody came. But Polydor didn't turn up. And then a few weeks later we got invited to go to London. And um, it's all a bit embarrassing now, but I, I arrived in this uh, studio and um, there was one of these coffee table books. And in it, there was pictures of all the big bands at the time. And there was a girl band called Eternal. And um, with this band Eternal was this, this guy with a ponytail. And he was giving them an award. And we looked up and through the glass on the other side was this same guy. His name was Dennis. And he was like this big manager. And we walked into the glass room and he had our CD. And he said, right, who's the singer? And I said, oh, that's me. He said, come on then, sing. So he put the CD on, and I had to sing along. And he said, yeah, okay, thank you very much. We'll see you again soon. So we were like, what? Well, we thought we were going to be like really famous, get signed there and then. We've proved it's us. He just liked it, but we were very young, so he just wanted to keep in touch. So off we went. And then I went to university. The band split up. I kept Dennis's card. And then when I finished university, I got in contact with him. And he said, good, let's do some songwriting. So I signed the contract, bought the new guitar, and then he would ring me every now and again. I'd be in this terrible job that I hated. And he'd say, right, where are you? I'd say, oh, at work. Can you get your guitar for me? Uh, yes, but I'm kind of in my, I did wear a suit back then, in my suit. He said, I need you at this place at this time. And I'd go to these really dark recording studios, not knowing what I was doing, and they'd just say, play. And I'd have to come up with something. And so, it was a bit disappointing, I never really made anything of it, but the biggest highlight for me was there are two famous people that I don't know if you know, okay? And you probably won't, but I'll say the names for some of the people in the audience. There's a very famous musician called Paul Weller, who was once in a big band called The Jam, and I played on the same stage as Paul Weller, and another very famous artist called Van Morrison, who's a very old man now, and I also played on the same stage as him. Now, it was a very big concert, and they were the headliners, and I was like the very first person on at 10 a.m. in the morning. 
but I'm still on the same poster. I had a poster of Paul Weller on my bedroom wall as I grew up. Um, something that really annoys me about people entering into um, the workplace is that all the applications are online and Tesco's must have thousands of online um, applications. And because it's all online, the individual gets no feedback, um, there's, there's no person-to-person -person contact. So what's the advice to all the young people in this room who in a few years' time will be applying? How do you make your application stand out? How do you make your individuality stand out in an online application? Uh, it, it's very difficult. Um, in, in Tesco we have two different ways of doing it. So if you're in the big stores, it's still very much written, paper-based applications, you can walk in, apply, etc. But for the office it is absolutely all online. Some businesses now have moved to things like video interviewing and as part of that you can do a video application but you've really just got to make sure that you only have one chance um, with that application form and so you've got to stand out and think about how you don't make it pretentious and don't pretend to be something you're not but you just say maybe something a little bit controversial in that application that makes you stand out and makes somebody interested in why I should look at your CV ahead of somebody else's. If you just try and fit the outline of the application and you make sure that you tick every box in the same way you would if you filled out a form for like a passport or something, um, it's, you're going to really, really struggle. And ultimately, um, you've got to try and find out how, how can you give yourself some experiences that will give you the edge. So I feel like um, it might not be work paid experience, but there are certainly things you can get involved in that would make you stand out. There's loads of opportunities now, whether it be volunteering, projects, things that mean you're not just going to school today, going home, going to school tomorrow, and then following all the usual paths so then you can apply to work um, in any organisation. You have to have something that's a little bit different. So make the most out of all of the activities, projects and things that are in front of you and seek them out as well would be my advice. Um, I would also use a lot of the social media tools. So I'd be thinking, go on LinkedIn. I would be thinking about um, how can you make your voice heard so uh, you can comment on things. You could even uh, write opinions and stories about things that interest you because you leave a footprint. And if I'm slightly interested in your application form, I will look at your footprint and say, how can I hear a bit more about that person before I decide? In India, the number of applications for certain job types are absolutely enormous. And I appreciate it's much harder here than it is in some of the other European countries. But they would be some of my tips. That okay? That's a big wave. So last question, last question. Better be a good one. Um, uh, what's the most interesting question you've ever asked anyone during an interview over? I've heard a lot of horror stories about people in interviews and how hard the questions are. So I just wanted to know what is your experience with that? Well, I'm not a horrible interviewer. I have to do lots of them. But because my job is HR director, if I ask something controversial, I will probably get the sack. So I tend to... The one thing I always ask at the end is I say, I'm very good. And then I say, what is the one question that I should have asked you? And then they, they normally say, oh, well, you know, I would, have, I would have asked me about my experience of X, Y, Z. And I say, well, tell me about it then. And actually, they end up exposing themselves. They end up talking about something that, you know, they weren't prepared to do. And it's quite interesting because they're kind of prepped in their mind about how they're going to go through all these different pointers in their CV. And then suddenly I've thrown that at them. And um, that's my favourite one. Don't tell anybody else I use it, otherwise it won't work. But um, that was good. I've got some more hands, but shall I take one more, or are you running out of time? Okay, one more. It has to be quick and good. Shout it out to me. So, what's your favourite part about your job right now in human resources? Uh, it's very, it sounds very cheesy, but making it honestly making a difference. So, I had a, when I went to Canada, we saw in uh, one of the towns. There was nothing much in this town, but all of their zebra crossings and the crossroads were all rainbows 
and it, it literally made the town feel brilliant. Um, and so I went back to the office and I said to my boss, I think we should paint rainbows instead of black and white crossings to show everybody that everyone is welcome at Tesco. And she said, oh, no, no, no. She said, the cars won't know to stop, people will get run over, you'll never get that through. So I didn't let it rest. When I came to India, I said to my new boss, I think we should paint the cross. He said, oh, people don't do that in India, Robbie. We're not ready for it here. <laughs> so then I secretly went and spoke to all the members of the leadership team and I said, we need rainbows, don't we? And they all said yes. And so eventually, I made it happen, and I invited all of my team, and I said, let's come out and paint this together. Um, and our uh, campus looks great for it, and actually we're delivering on some of those promises about changing our policies for um, lesbian, gay, bisexual community, anybody can come and work here. It's brilliant. So I feel like I can do those things, and that, that, um, that for me is the most powerful bit, most exciting bit. Great questions, everybody. Thank you very much. On behalf of the ISP, we would like to thank Mr. Robbie for coming and giving a very entertaining talk today. Thank you. Now we now have a memento for you. Amy will have to decide where this goes in the house, I think, but that's uh, lovely. Thank you very much, everybody.